giving names, no games as I run it down the line. We got Kenny Ken Ken, put a hundred on the tees with the streak for the cash. He yes, be in. Seth Curry with the shot. The prodigy. In reality, he's more like Seth, but he's all we got. Up next is Gentleman Jack, better known as Junior Blue. We told him not to do it anyway, but he did what he do. To his right is Devin, that dude, L Dad or Dirt Ass Dan. Just don't ask him a question, cause then he'll answer your question with another question, and then he'll add another question on top of that question. Damn. And now I'm Red O. The Buck Wild Problem Child. Slow Butter, aka John Cutter. It's the league ambassadors, and we playing to win. At the two yard line, and make no mistake, we running it in. Welcome to 32 Kings Road, hosted by the League Ambassadors. I'm Ambassador Kenny Ken Ken, and it is my pleasure to be here today with my brothers. This is episode 43, second season of our show. And today, after 43 episodes of 32 Kings Road, I've got to make a commitment. <laughs> <laughs> As a reminder, you can follow us everywhere on social media. Our handle is at the League AM. That is Twitter. That is Facebook. That is Instagram. Um, also, check out our website, theleagueam.com. Uh, Diplomatic Immunity, please. It's our on site uh, blog spot. Uh, anyone that's interested in making a submission, please uh, do that there. A uh, shout out to Chief Diplomat Nick Blackman. Um, yeah, I mean, let's get the show going. Kevin, wake up. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> Kevin froze for a bit there. Yeah, Kevin froze. Kevin, you with us? I am here. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <all right. laughs> what you sipping on, baby? Good evening, everybody. Um, <laughs> first and foremost, I am sipping on that good old H2O for um, our brother Redo. Uh, who can't be here with us today. Um, but more importantly, um, I, I wore this shirt for good reason because friends don't lie. I have to, I have to, you know, admit when I'm wrong and stand corrected. Uh, no, I'm not apologizing to Kenyon for his prediction last week. Um, <coughs> I, I am, however, going to give more props to Mr. Nick Foles, who not only, as I mentioned last week, survived Jeff Fisher, but also overcame the coaching of both Andy Reid and Chip Kelly, all the while, while starring in the lead role in Napoleon Dynamite. I can't. <laughs> I can't. I don't know how he does it. Nick Foles must be Sterling K. Brown because only a black guy can overcome what he has in his career. <laughs> Junior Blue, what are you sipping on? <laughs> I'm sipping on this Stella right here. Mm -hmm. And also, tonight, 30,000 points for LeBron. Youngest player ever to do it. And what that really means is five more seasons, averaging 20 points a game, he will pass Kareem for the number one all-time scorer in NBA. Yeah. And um, if he stays healthy, I don't see how he can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that... That's a pretty that's a pretty big feather in the cap. Yeah. When you talk about arguments for one you know, one of the all time greats. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It's it it's, it's, a, it's a good accomplishment. Uh I'm sipping staying with young phenoms, <laughs> Mr. Arrow Spence. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Spence. That was almost the goose. It's, it's strap season. <laughs> hey. It's strap season. Who want that smoke? Who want free smoke? <laughs> Who want free smoke? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, man. It's it's just great to see a champion. And for those of you that don't know who I am referring to, please, uh, if you care or have any sort of interest in boxing, uh, mm. start following this man. We've been talking about him for a solid year now. Mm. Arrow Spence, 147-pounder weight class. That's the welterweight. Uh, it's been a long time since we've had a champion mm -hmm. who is not only getting the belts but then calling out everybody. Mm -hmm. He is he is he's the nicest bully you can find. <laughs> <laughs> and let let okay, so people were talking shit about Mr. Uh, Peterson, but the way that he walked through him. Like Peterson's a dog. We all know yeah. that when Peterson comes to fight like and a lot of people will in that position will oh this is an easy fight so to say a lot of people actually thought it was going to be a tougher fight than that, but oh you get the win you do was nah. Nah. 
No, nah, he went. No, nah, he went. He went. He went for it. He went for it. He's he he wants blood every time he's out. <laughs> he's one of those boxers that when he gets hit with a good shot, he greets you with a smile, uh-huh. and then he commences to whipping your ass. Yeah. <laughs> Dad, what you sipping on? Ah, uh, you know me, double fisting, <laughs> risking it all. Risking it all. Uh, Lagunitas <laughs> IPA, the little blue moon. He's not even white. switching up. <laughs> <laughs> nah, hey, hey. You know, you know, he you gonna know what's in some bread. You know, <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing in the coffers. So you know, um, what what I'm sipping on. Uh, so yesterday, uh, since we're talking about momentous events, uh, marked the 12th, uh, 12 year anniversary anniversary of Kobe's. Then that's the basketball beats and broads. Kobe's eighty one point game versus the Toronto Raptors. Um, so I wanted to talk. I wanted to use that to segue it into something else, but it, that's one of those moments in sports where you remember where you were when it happened. Now, for me, I was on my way to my girlfriend at the time's house, who's now my wife, and I turned on hey. sports radio. I didn't know where that was going. <laughs> <laughs> and I pull up in her driveway, and I just like I'm listening to the press conference. I'm like, why are they doing this press conference? And you just hear like. Hey, hey, you know, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. You know, that's just crazy. I'm like, what? What's going on? They're talking to Kobe, and then I hear what happened. And I'm like, this motherfucker did not just score 81 points. I didn't actually see the game. So um, I have two questions that I want to ask uh, with regards to this event. Um, but I want to start with uh, where you were when you when this happened, because it's something that you remember. And uh, Junior Blue, since you are a Laker fan, I'd like to start with you. I was at my apartment in Inglewood, <laughs> city of champions. L.A. through and through, baby. <laughs> and I got me a La Villa burrito. <laughs> I remember what I was eating. Shout out to La Villa. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I sat there and I was frustrated because they was fucking losing. Mm-hmm. And then they checked them in and um, who was that, Sam Mitchell? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Had no clue about double teaming anybody. Mm. And uh, it was, I, I just remember watching the replay over and over again, like, how did he score 81? Why couldn't they stop him? Oh, a uh, party foul in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we don't have to pay for that. <laughs> I, I definitely remember where I was. I was down in this basement. It wasn't all ravened out like it is now. Um, but I was down here with, uh, with Slug. We were watching TV, uh, actually ESPN News. And if you remember, 12 years ago, HDTV wasn't what it is now, but ESPN News used to have that burgundy and gold, um, like, I guess, template on the screen. And the mm-hmm. bottom right hand, well, I guess if you're looking at me, it was down here on the screen. Mm-hmm. It said Kobe Bryant. It had like some number we couldn't read in the third <laughs> quarter. And we kept look. We tried to find a game. It wasn't on national TV. Tried to pull it up online. And for some reason, that number kept growing and we couldn't read it. Finally pulled up on the computer, and he had like 75 points in the fourth quarter. And we were down here going nuts. Like, we have to go somewhere where we can watch it. And by the time it actually hit that that really happened, my dad was a big Laker fan. It was it was nuts, man. You just called everybody you knew and asked if they seen it. I missed that shit. <laughs> Kenyon, where were you when this happened? <laughs> I'm sure he was saying that. <laughs> I was actually at the game, <laughs> and I was screaming Kobe at the top of my lungs. Um, it's funny because that game, to me, like from a scoring standpoint, I think he's had two games that were more impressive than that game. I think the 62 Kobe, Dallas, 61 yeah. Dallas at the end of the third <laughs> quarter, he was ridiculously on fire. Um, and then the 65 that he had against Portland, which was also a game in the following season that I attended. Uh, out of those 65 points, he only had 11 free throws. I think he only he made eight threes. This game was just about sheer will. But what I remember about it, it was an, a spiritual experience, <laughs> which is exactly the sp- experience I felt in Kobe's last game when he scored 60. It's it's just it's just one of those things you can't you cannot quantify with words. It uh, just takes over you. And right. you're right, Les. We booed the Lakers because they were terrible. We booed them off the court in the first half. The thing that's interesting about that 81 point game is that 
it was during a stretch during the season where Kobe was he was routinely getting like 40 a night like mm -hmm. he went through like a nine or ten game stretch where he was scoring 40 and 50 um but the frustration with the offense being so Kobe citric was so high with Phil Jackson that in the second and the first quarter I want to say he had like 22 points Phil sat him at the end of the bench for almost the entire second quarter he didn't come back into the second quarter till about four minutes left because he was trying to force the rest of the guys mm -hmm. to run the offense and not just dump it and throw it to Kobe. Yeah. So even with Kobe sitting out eight, nine minutes in the second quarter, he still finished with that 81 points. That's because he scored 50-something in the second half. He went off. He scored 50, <laughs> yeah, he scored, he scored 55 in the second yeah. half. Uh, he went, he went he off. He went nuts. He went nuts. So that leads into my next question, and it's interesting because as amazing as that 81 points is, that's actually not the record. Uh, in the NBA, 100 points by Will Chamberlain back in 1960 is the record. So I have a hard time believing that that's going to be broken. I mean, if, if Kobe couldn't do it, I don't know who would. But what other amazing sport records do you guys think will never be broken? First of all, I think Kobe could have done it. Well, he didn't. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he can't do it now. <laughs> yeah, so what, what, what records do you guys think are safe? Uh, I think Emmitt Smith's 18,000. Uh, 355 rushing yards are safe, partly because uh, football has changed so much, mm -hmm. also partly because that position has been devalued, and then finally because uh, there's just no one on the horizon that you know that's going to be behind that kind of line. Yeah, <laughs> for a, for a minute, for a minute there, you thought Adrian Peterson might have had a shot a few years back, uh, but then uh, it it dropped off tremendously. But I think mm -hmm. that's one record that definitely is going to stand. Yeah, and keep it with running backs. I'm thinking Barry Sanders, 14, 14. consecutive 100-yard games. I mean, the NFL just isn't designed for one running back to carry the load anymore, let alone get three or four consecutive 100-yard games. Chris 14 Johnson with no close. line? Chris Johnson got close with 12, but that's the closest anybody got. I think um, 1406 for Ricky Henderson, stolen Man. bases. Yeah, let's talk when, about that. When the, the next person... And he's active. Jose Reyes has mm -hmm. 512. Yeah, no. And he's 34. And he's 34. You know, and again, and, and, and I don't even know where you're going with it, Devin, but again, I feel like with with what we've said so far, the common thread is, again, the way the game has changed. changing. They don't, which I don't understand this, I don't know why they don't take extra bases. Like, that is no longer a point of emphasis. And, like, it's a it's a novelty when, when, it, when there's a team that does it. That does it, yeah. It, it, it has to do with... The way that they're playing baseball, like you said, the game has evolved. They're striking out more yep. and trying to hit more home runs. Yep. Um, staying in baseball, me personally, I don't think that DiMaggio's 56 I agree with that. will ever be broken. And same thing, again, part of that because how they play. They yeah. are trying to hit the ball out of the park. I agree with that. That I mean, yeah. go ahead, Kev. I was going to say, and of course, we'd be remiss to not mention Cal's Iron Man streak, but probably more impressively, Joe Thomas's consecutive streak that just ended – uh, this past season, I don't yeah. see anybody playing that many consecutive snaps, especially if they're on a bad team. That's like insane! Yeah. Ten thousand yeah. snaps. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Another one that I that I had was uh, obviously it's a, again it's a different time, so there's a theme here. But Wilt Chamberlain grabbing fifty five rebounds uh, <laughs> in 1960. <laughs> An interesting thing about that is since 1973, no one has grabbed more than 37. The most that was grabbed in the 80s was by Charles Oakley. That was 35 in 1988. In the 90s, Charles Barkley grabbed 33 in 96. Barkley had 33? Yeah. In, He's in, amazing, in by two, the way. In 2000, <laughs> no one got over 30. 2010, Kevin Love got 31. Wow. So that, that's, wow. that's never going to be done. Russell Westbrook. If you see how intentional he is about grabbing rebounds <laughs> for reasons, he may try to break that. <laughs> It's quite possible. It's, I mean, 35. It'll never go down. I don't think, because, well, first of all, and, you know, um, we listen to a lot of Lakers broadcast, the local broadcasting team, which is, uh, what's his name? Which Joel Mc, McDonald. McDonald, Bill McDonald and Stu Lance. Mm -hmm. Stu Lance talks about the big man. He used to hold, host big man's camp, work at Pete mm -hmm. Newell's big man's camp, and he has lamented for years about how, Big men are not taught fundamental skills, one of those being how to rebound. No one how, boxes out. No one boxes out. Uh, 
Jeff Van Gundy, mm-hmm. the same night you made a joke, you mm-hmm. made a joke about it in passing. Mm-hmm. Jeff Van Gundy actually said on the broadcast, he was like, "No one boxes out anymore. Like Just that is not even. It's not even a thing." So I don't think with with the thirty five, it, it's more about how the guys play 55. today, 55, or fifty five. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> with the fifty five, it's about how the guys play and the lack of fundamentals being taught. Mm-hmm. Because I, you know, there are definitely some guys that I'm thinking of off the off the rip that I know. DeAndre Jordan, he don't have nothing else to do but grab <laughs> rebounds. <laughs> I think the most um, got is like 25. It's like 20, I mean, yeah. You make the ESPN bottom line if you get 20 rebounds. Now. Right, right. And this right. dude grabbed 55. 55. Now, um, yeah. That's, that's just utterly ridiculous. And on, it, it, as a team aspect of it, uh, two that I mentioned, and we can move on from here, but UCLA winning seven straight national championships yeah. in basketball and the Celtics winning eight, that shit's never going to happen. How many does Alabama have? Not, <laughs> not in a row. <laughs> Right. In a row, UConn's yeah. ninety game winning streak. That yeah, I was gonna say the UConn women's basketball actually, team. Actually, they might break that. <laughs> oh yeah, how many? <laughs> yeah, how, that's a real question, Kevin. How many in a row have they had? Have they won? Well, I would have to check because I don't constantly watch. <laughs> they, they just Kevin, last it's year. me and you. We supposed to, we 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 know about the women's. Whoa. <laughs> 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 I think it's time to move on. The <laughs> oh God, Kev. Uh, hey guys, <laughs> let's move on to the Brexit boot bag award winner, Kevin. Oh my God! Look, we have a lot to get into with this, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Mike, cue the music. Uh, so we have New York Jets wide receiver, Mr. Robert Stephen Anderson who was arrested uh, this past Friday, early Friday morning in Florida on charges of reckless driving. He was going 105 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone, uh, resisting arrest and eluding police. So according to Robbie's lawyer, Mr. Ed O'Donnell, and I quote, the charges are totally out of character for Robbie. (laughs) Now, if Mr. O'Donnell truly knew his client, he would know so this is actually Robbie's second time <laughs> within a year being arrested in Florida uh, as he was rest- arrested um, at the Rolling Loud Music Festival on a felony count of resisting arrest with violence and also obstruction of justice. Hold on, Kev. At what music? What's the name of the music festival? Rolling Loud. Rolling Loud. Mm, we'll, we'll, so keep you going. You know what keep he going. was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so Robbie's lawyer continued to say that Robbie, and I quote, is just a fine young man who I hold in high regard, who plans to attend church with his mother this past Sunday and will sit down with his lawyer to discuss the case the next day. (laughs) Well, since Robbie is such a fine young man, I truly hope he told his mother during confessional that the last charge that he caught this past Friday was threatening a public servant, which is where this gets interesting. (laughs) (laughs) So, according to the police report, while in the back of the patrol vehicle, Robbie told the arresting officer that when he got out of jail, he was going to, my dad, if you're watching this, I'm sorry, but I quote, find my wife, fuck her, and nut in her eye. (laughs) End quote. (laughs) Robbie uh, also continued to make other verbal threats uh, toward the officer, towards his family, and also began bragging about how much money he had. And that the officer was simply trying to, and I quote, ruin his fun. Robbie. <laughs> Robbie. <laughs> Come on, bro. Listen, this, I, this may be our best award winner this year, in my personal opinion. Now, now that this info, granted, does come up from a police report. We know the history of the police department in this country, <laughs> especially in Florida. Uh, so, but we'll assume that these statements are true. And oh, since, they're true. <laughs> since <laughs> he was rolling loud, <laughs> he was rolling loud. <laughs> since uh, Robbie Anderson obviously cannot be here with us tonight, I'm uh, I'm going to offer him this gift from me because he truly is a dick <laughs> in the most literal sense. And um, since he can't be here with us tonight, I will accept this Brexit boot bag award on his behalf. <laughs> Because, sir, you, you earned this one, buddy. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yes, he did. Yeah, he did. What's up with these Jets receivers? Uh, <laughs> right? Jeremy Curley? They Curly? trying to get out of town, bro. <laughs> <laughs> 
They try it's to Hamsterdam. They're trying to get out of Hamsterdam. Hackenberg. <laughs> that's our that's our future. Oh <laughs> man. Robbie, Robbie. Kevin, great job on your Rachel Maddow. I like how you broke that down and set it up. Uh and 32 Kings Row, the only place where you don't have to bleep out anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to our football tea hot topics. Uh we've spent a lot of time talking about uh, the head coaching carousel, and we will go over the latest uh, NFL head coaching hi- hirings. Uh, but there's been a, there's been a lot of movement amongst coordinators in the NFL, both offensive coordinators and defensive coordinators. We've had the Cleveland Browns announce yesterday that they hired uh, Mr. Todd Haley, formerly of the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, the Cincinnati <laughs> Bengals. Replaced their defensive coordinator, Mr. Paul Gunther, with Terrell Austin, who was the defensive coordinator for the Detroit Lions um, and seems to be always on the list of almost head coaches. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Pete Carroll uh, (laughs) went back and did some real recycling. He went to the hot tub time machine and got Brian Schottenheimer to replace Darren Bevel on offense. And he got Ken... Norton Jr. Mm. to replace Chris Richard on defense, and he can ask Lesk about the Ken Norton experience. Um, we've got Carolina that okay. Huh. If Pete if Pete went into the hot tub time machine, uh, he went to the hater time machine from Chappelle. <laughs> Carolina went way back. <laughs> Ron Rivera got his father figure, uh. Norm Turner. <laughs> To come and to help uh, resuscitate Cam Newton's career. So, uh, and then we've got, you know, um, we've got Buffalo that went into the college ranks and got Brian Dayball from Alabama. He was the offensive coordinator down there for Nick Saban for one year and brought him back. We've got um, (laughs) the Chicago Bears, Matt Nagy, who went and got Oregon's fired head coach, Mark Helfrick, to run the offense there in Chicago. Um... What do we make of here? What what's what is there a move that you actually like amongst the coordinators, Junior Blue? I actually like the um the day ball one. You do? I do like it. And okay. what's the what team is getting rated of all their coordinators right now? The Patriots. Okay. Yeah. And he was in line to be their offensive coordinator because he was their tight end coach. Uh, he went to Alabama, yeah. became their OC, yeah. and when McDaniels leaves her wherever he leaves for, hmm. um, he was probably going to be in line to be their next OC. Belichick sent him down there to save him, exactly. to stash him. And, mm-hmm. um, hey. And Buffalo moved on it. AFC East. You know, right. is that, that's retribution for the Stephen Gilmore. See? <laughs> ah, okay. Got and which, long game. And which, mm-hmm. one, and which one do you not like? Ken Norton Jr.? <laughs> um, what is Pete doing? What I don't know Pete what he's doing? doing, but Ken Norton looked real good when that whole defense was young. Hmm. Um, now that they're older, it's not gonna look the same. Yeah, Dad, which move you like? I actually like the the Helfrick move. I know he just got fired, but hear me out. <laughs> hear me out. I'm listening. <laughs> All right. So you have a young QB You're sticking up for Omar. I appreciate nah, that. I, you have a young QB <laughs> that's athletic. <laughs> yes. Uh, utilize the creativity that he used. Um, I mean, he did. He was the coach there when Mariota got his Heisman. Um, they're not the same talent, mm-hmm. but. In that sort of offense, we know it was run three and a half downs and pass one. Mm-hmm. So I think most of the uh, changes and the the sexy shit comes from college nowadays. Yeah, you have a stagnant offense. You have a a good defense. A young quarterback, go for it. So yeah, I mean that that was also one of the questions, Kev. Like, how do we feel? I mean, it, w- it was reported that Mike Vrabel was really trying to go hard after Ryan O'Day, the. Mm-hmm. Uh, quarterback's coach at Ohio State, but apparently he stayed and is going to be the OC there. How do we feel about, and Vrabel actually made a comment when they talked about the NFL farm system, and Vrabel in his press conference yesterday with Tennessee said that uh, Urban Meyer is the farm system, Nick Saban is the farm system, Jim Harbaugh is the farm system. How do we feel, though, about uh, these NFL coaches, these organizations digging into the college ranks to get coordinators or to get coaches to come up are we are we okay with that well first and foremost it is a move out of desperation um, but that doesn't mean that it won't succeed Mm -hmm. and i think that it's a smart move because you know i think they're jumping ahead of the curve in terms of going to the college game because like devin said the college game it kind of sets the precedence for creativity 
whether it be like the nuances in, in, in the offenses or the schemes, before it gets to the NFL. So I think if you can get ahead of the curve and try to get a young guy or someone who you know has experience working with different packages and, and different dynamics of offense, we saw what the Wildcat was. What the um the, the the option offense was before it came to the NFL, I think it's smart. Junior Blue, but aren't we losing something in terms of the tradition and sort of the fundamentals? I mean, isn't that sort of the age old argument? You look at a team like Alabama, and yes, there are spread concepts, and, and it took Nick Saban a while to even sort of adjust and adapt to it. Mm -hmm. But still, fundamentally, you look at how they recruit, and you look at the mixture of the run and the pass. There are still fundamental elements there. If the NFL goes completely to that college side are you concerned that maybe we'll start to see fundamentals slip at the nfl level which is something that is a problem that's being experienced and we're seeing right now in the nba i mean i feel like the fundamentals have already slipped mm -hmm. uh, hmm. and i mean you can tell in the offensive line you could tell by wide receivers the routes they run um quarterbacks the way they read and what they do it's already slipped but the way that the nfl is going is passing they're spreading it out they're going away from runs um, that's my main problem with these retread offensive coordinators yeah. and why mm. I like it actually going to the OC and stuff like that. Yeah. I go into um, college for OCs. Yeah. I think, um, I think that's an interesting point that you made up. Cause you look at a lot of these names, you even look at these head coaches, like as we start to, as we start to go into looking at Pat Shermer, who's now mm -hmm. the head coach for the New York giants, um, you know, John Gruden coming back to the Raiders. Um, we know that offensive coordinators usually are the ones that are next in line to be a head coach. Or they're the ones that get sort of the first looks uh, whenever openings come up for head coaches. Is there any sort of concern that because we're recycling these same players, are we, and by players I mean these coaches in these offensive coordinator roles, that it's not going to give any sort of opportunity for new sort of voices or new candidates to emerge. That, um, I'm, I mean, that's it's always been the good old boy network. Uh, I don't know how that actually actually changes. Um, I think that when you do start to look at the college ranks instead of you know the the retreads like we talked about then that may change. Um, I mean, North Turner, like you said, just got hired on as, a, as an <laughs> I OC. don't even understand. And, and, action pass. And he, <laughs> he, he, might be, he might be a Hall of Fame offensive coordinator. Yeah. But he is also the guy that retired on the Minnesota Vikings last year and couldn't get them going. And he's the reason why Pat Sherman is now the head coach right. of the Giants. Right. So at some point, you you do have to start looking outside of the lines because you know you're tired of seeing the same old same old. Kev, yeah, I I agree, and I mean I think it's obvious, of course, that you know America's most famous sport would replicate its most infamous pastime in terms of you know <laughs> your homeboy fails over here. Okay, bring him in, let him work himself up, get his confidence back, and then send him back out there to to, to get another job that's being held for this good old boy network and not letting new guys like you mentioned Terrell Austin how many years has he been in line for a head coaching job and then not came he just keeps getting recycled as a coordinator that glass ceiling is just as evident the last time I for, think yeah and I mean well and and, and hopefully well the yeah, thing hopefully. is is that I would I've heard Terrell Austin's name much longer than I've heard Mike Vrabel's what? name and Mike Vrabel got a job you know so it's you know that's a you know that's a Where, whole where's he come from that's a hope. Well, he does, and that's you know where, where winning is fundamental. The Patriots, yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, uh, another hot topic here: uh, the NFL today uh, launched a campaign to build on their commitment to social justice. Um, hasn't gotten a lot of play. Um, definitely, there are some elements here of of PR, um, but I think all in all, in an encouraging start, uh, they're launching a campaign called "Let's Listen Together," where um, it's a multi layered rollout, including digital content, um, brand spots, social media support, highlighting players that are actively uh, taking on projects um, to a address injustices within the community um also there were two grants as a part of this program two grants that the nfl is going to fund one grant is available to players both active and retired that decide to pursue uh projects uh concerning social injustice um 
uh, criminal reform. Um, and then there's also going to be a grant set up by the NFL to support actual teams that create foundations uh, with the same mission, the same cause. Uh, newsworthy or nah, Kev? Nah. <laughs> Listen, I, I ain't falling for the hype. We've seen this already. I'll believe it when it starts to actually make an impact and not just be a PR stunt for the NFL. I'll believe it when I see a Let's Listen Together commercial in the Super Bowl. Mm. Doesn't look like anything to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, in theory, it's a good idea. Um, it's a good thought. It's what you do when you don't have the answer. Is it the answer? I don't believe so. Hey, Slug, uh, Slug said on the, the Facebook live thread, as a, I guess as a practice as someone who didn't buy their kids many Christmas gifts, this is just stocking stuffing. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get to our conference champion postmortem. Uh, this past Sunday, we had two games. Uh, the first one, the AFC, the New England Patriots. Uh, prevailed over the upstart Jacksonville Jaguars 24 uh, to 20. Um, Jaguars were ahead for most of the game. The New and England referee uh, looked, looked as if they were going to pull an upset, uh, but Tom Brady uh, said no, <laughs> and New England prevailed. Uh, and then in the second game, uh, mm. the Philadelphia Eagles thrashed the Minnesota Vikings 38 to 7. Uh, Case Keenum had a pivotal pick six, uh, and then Chris Long, Howie's son, had a very big game, uh, uh, including a strip sack fumble recovery. Nick Foles uh, was lights out, uh, and the Eagles made it look pretty easy. It was a celebration for about three quarters there. Um, so let's focus on both the losers, the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Minnesota Vikings. Um, and it's funny because I think the, the off season, the, the most pivotal off season questions that need to be asked, uh, can be asked of both of these teams. Mm -hmm. So first of all, uh, question number one, I'll start with you, Kev, who should be the starting quarterback in 2018? Let's first start with your adopted team, the Jacksonville Jaguars. Baby Jags. You're asking me who should be their starting quarterback? Or yes. Who will be their starting who quarterback? Who should be their starting quarterback? It should be someone else. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it will be Blake Bortles. I mean, look, the last two playoff games he played in, he did what more than what any of us could have asked for him to do to keep them in that game. And, you know, I think that's enough because, you know, we don't necessarily know what Blake Bortles is, but we know what he isn't. Um, and I think the Jags are willing to invest in that uncertainty for an extent, maybe a year or two, just to see if he can actually well, go and take that. Yeah, next he's step. got. He has. He so to be clear, he does have one more year left on his deal. Uh, it is a team option. You agree with that, Dad? That it should be someone else in Jacksonville, <laughs> unless there is a clear cut better option. I think it is Blakey is what me and Joe were calling him on Sunday because <laughs> he actually did play outside of his mind. Some of those things weren't. I mean, the game they did not lose because of them. No, we had this conversation the week before. The you know, jokingly, the defense. Hey, I need you to get me this, and he he, he delivered. He, did, he delivered. Yes, and some. I mean, the the pass that was bad away at the last minute. That was spot on. Was a great defensive play. Yeah. I kind of question that the pass that the wheel route down the sideline to Fournette it looked like Fournette did not did give his best effort to get to that. And that's been my problem with Fournette since day one. It wasn't on him. It, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. It's a it's a tough. It's that was a tough play call considering the personnel. I think uh, Bortles has been making that throw all year to Chris Ivory to mm. T.J. Yeldon, not necessarily to Fournette. So you're trying to put a square peg in a round hole in there. But let's be clear. He, I think he, I agree with. I think he played a great game, mm. um, but you you feel like it should be someone else still, though. I, I said that unless there's a clear-cut better option out there, whether it's through the draft or if they make a move or someone's available that they can get. Mm -hmm. If it's a clear-cut, like, if, like if, if they pick up Case Keenum, that's not necessarily a clear-cut. If it's someone that's okay. a legitimate head and shoulders above him yes. to make that move. So would you put Eli there? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Eli is clear cut better. Tom Coughlin than Blake yeah. Portos. Junior Blue, you feel the I, same way? I feel the same way. Um, my problem with Blake is basically their defense can keep you in it. Who here believes Blake can make that play to win the game? Okay, He's trying to. So I mean, here's the thing, guys. <laughs> like, I, I mean, let's 
like it's been like because we started shitting on Blake Bortles. Let's be clear in our first season. Yeah, everyone, everyone. But we did in our first season, and we kept shitting on him throughout the season, really waiting for the other shoe to drop. And honestly, outside of maybe the two games after they had clinched the playoff spot, he's played reasonably well. Yeah. It's a tough decision, I think, if you're Jacksonville. I think there's probably a more pertinent question that needs to be answered specifically with Jacksonville. But, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think he proved enough. In my opinion, I think he, I think he proved enough to where right. you, you, you run it back with him, Kev. Yeah. And one thing the four of us can all say is that we all witnessed in person the greatest game Blake Bortles ever played in his life. <laughs> <laughs> we know he's capable. <laughs> Minnesota Vikings, though, mm. who should be, and I'll come back to you, Kevin, the starting quarterback in 2018? I think it should be Case Keenum because he played well enough this season to get them where they are. He deserved it. But the NFL is not about deserving. It's about potential and future. And I think it will be Teddy Bridgewater, assuming he's 100% healthy. That? I think if you ask the Vikings, they don't have a clue because they don't have any quarterbacks under contract right now. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, can you trust the health of Sam Bradford? No. No. Can Never. you trust the health of Teddy Bridgewater at probably, this point in time? Probably so. Can you? Maybe. I mean, he's he wasn't hurt in college. He's been hurt a bit in the NFL. But his knee disintegrated. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know what you can get with Case Keenum. Now, they're talking about franchising him. Yeah, see. Mm. And that's like, what, $20 million? Franchise 20? tagging Case Keenum? That would be like $24 million. 22, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 22 or 24 24 yeah. million. I mean, they're in a tough spot with that. But they have to make some sort of decision. Now, what I've been hearing or reading is that they really, really love Sam Bradford. <laughs> 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 I, 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 hey, that's that's my response. <sighs> but you can't. I mean, his knees, his knees are worse than mine. His knees, his elbows, his shoulders, <laughs> like everything. Junior Blue. I actually think it should be Teddy Bridgewater. I mean, they were trying to switch out Keenum when he was one five in a row. Now you're talking about twenty four million for Keenum. But didn't they just demote him to the third string? I was gonna say right. They so yeah, that's because obviously they love. Uh, <laughs> Sam Bradford. Sam Bradford. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what any quarterbacks that. under contract. It just worked out that way. I I mean, uh, you know, in this situation, I think you lost Pat Shermer, your offensive coordinator. I mm-hmm. think you've got to be like, all right, the Case Keenan thing was cute. He had a connection with Pat Shermer. <laughs> yeah. Let him walk. I think running back with Teddy B, Teddy uh-huh. Bridgewater, who the guys they like. And you know, and go get another backup, and don't even fall for Sam Bradford. I think I think it should be <laughs> I think it should be Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, all right, Junior Blue. Question number two for both teams. Again, starting with Jacksonville, is this the start of a run, or was this season a flash in the pan? Well, going back to the first question, with Blake Bortles at quarterback, they could easily go six and ten next year, and be a flash in the pan. Or they can run it back and be 12-4 and four with that defense and him playing the the role of, hey, I'm going to dump it off. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I, have, I, I say have all no this to say I don't know. I have no idea. Listen, <laughs> I expect equivocation from Devin and from Kevin. Hey, I have no There's idea. no Omar here who's balls to the walls, right or wrong. I don't need hey, that from you, hey, Junior I'm Blue. I'm sorry. On this one, I don't know because they could easily – put up a record like the Raiders had this year. Dad, Jacksonville, start of the run, flash in the pan. I think it's the start of the run. Number one, Tom Coughlin. Number two, they have the foundation with um, how they built their team. Okay. Aside from the glaring weakness that we talk about all the time, everything else is there. I mean, you see with the most disrespected player in the league, they were a couple BS calls away from going to the Super Bowl. Hmm. So I... I th- I think in uh, one of the questions that I'll answer with this, but I'll just jump ahead. They gained experience this year. Yeah. Which they lacked. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. And they, they won a tough nose wild card game, which, you know, the offense, they were all nervous, but they won that. Mm-hmm. Then they go into Pittsburgh, of all places, not Pittsburgh. <laughs> and they, <laughs> Shout out to Red O. And, and they win a shootout of yeah. all things. Then they go into New England. And dominate for three and a half quarters. Go shot for shot with him, basically. Yeah. Kev? 
I agree. I think it's the start of a run for the reasons Devin mentioned, but also because the the powerhouses of the AFC that have controlled the conference for the last 10 years are finally fading out. Peyton Man is gone. Tom Brady, hopefully, if they win the Super Bowl this year, he retires. Um, and <laughs> Roethlisberger and the Steelers are on that last leg of you know their run. Outside of them, who else? Who else is left? I think they have a great opportunity to finally get a, a stranglehold on that on that conference and at least get a head up on the other teams. All right. So this is a gut feeling, and this is no shade whatsoever to Jacksonville because I mean I love their enthusiasm. I mentioned it during the game. Um, I saw flashes of them losing their composure in that game. It was getting right. a little bit edgy. I feel like they will come back next season, and I think there's going to be a little bit of a little bit of complacency. I think there's going to be a little bit of arrogance. I don't know if they are going to spend the money to get a legit outside playmaker, which jumping ahead to number three, but I think that that needs to happen. I don't think they're going to spend the money. I think that they're going to think that their young receivers, Keelan Cole, D.D. Westbrook, maybe they bring back Marquise Lee. I think they run it back with Blake Bortles. I think it turns into being a flash and a plan, and some of those volatile personalities that they have, those young, fly, flashy ballers, I think that I think, I think it might go the other way with them. I think it's a flash and a pan. The Minnesota Vikings, on the other hand, I think it's the start of a run for them. I think I believe very much in that defense. They have the receivers. They've got the playmakers. Mm -hmm. I don't think it matters too much who they bring in a quarterback. We know that out of the three that were there, Bradford, Bridgewater, Keenum, mm -hmm. someone's going to come back. Mm -hmm. And I think any three of those guys is good enough to keep them competitive in that division and maybe even and maybe and even allow them to, to go further. That's that's my thought. What do you think about the Vikings? I, I agree with the Vikings. Uh, you know, obviously, quarterback is, is a big, big deal. Um, but again, they are built correctly. Yeah. Um, inside out, uh, they got the right coach. Yes. Um, and to be honest, in that division, I feel that, and Omar's gonna like this. I feel like the Packers are on a decline. Um, they got rid of you know some key coaches, and like we had a discussion a couple weeks ago about you know McCarthy. Like, yeah. Let's be honest. Hmm. Um, Lions have a new head coach. He's never he's never been a, a coach in the league a head coach in the league before. Learning they have their curve, quarterback, yeah. Learning curve, and then you have the upstart Bears. They they're built for this. Yeah, and they're built for that division. Yeah, so I I think it's a run. Kev, oh god, I hate doing this, but I agree with Devin again <laughs> with those reasons mentioned. Um, but no, I think it's I think it's amazing that they made it as far as they did with the long list of injuries that they suffered mm -hmm. to in key positions. Um, I think next year they should be a top three, if not four, team in the NFC, um, assuming that those main pieces, whether it be Bridgewater and then I believe Dalvin Cook got hurt early yeah. in the season. He was on fire. Yeah. He went down. They still managed to make it to the NFC Championship game. Uh, hopefully, the piece they need to get over the top is to take Mr. Terrence Newman out in the backyard. <laughs> shoot, shoot his ass. <laughs> Junior Blue, you, you agree? Uh, I do agree. Um, their, defense is, their defense is young. Yes. And, and that's the thing. They do have to settle the quarterback position. But with that defense, the rest of the division on its way down are – a real upstart like the Bears, I think they it could be a run for them. Kevin alluded to it. The final question is, what's the one piece that both of these teams need to put them over the top? And and I just want to confirm with you, Kevin, for the Minnesota Vikings, that one piece is to assassinate Terrence Newman. Send him to the glue factory. <laughs> and listen, in the public square, let everyone see it. <laughs> <laughs> Julia Blue! Uh, uh, Dad, the one piece for Minnesota? For Minnesota, uh, they have to shore up that offensive line. They had so many different iterations of that line, and it got exposed on Sunday. <laughs> um, so they, they definitely have to shore that up. I agree with that. That's the thing. I think they got to address the O-line. Absolutely. Junior Blue? Line was sent him to the glue factory. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that was really wrong. It was Terry Staley! Hey, hey, hold up. He cannot be... In the in in the nickel. Listen, no, I, you know, I, I, listen. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to start any rumors. But I'm just saying, when Mike Zimmer was in Dallas, you know who was in Dallas? <laughs> yeah. Mike Zimmer, <laughs> Terrence Newman. Yeah. When Mike Zimmer was in Cincinnati, mm. you know who was in Cincinnati with Mike Zimmer? Terrence, Terrence Newman. Newman. He's about to be the Mike TV coach. Mike Zimmer's in Minnesota. Terrence Newman's also in Minnesota. <laughs> so either somebody sucking somebody dick. Or <laughs> oh. <laughs> Damn. And on that note, let's go to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Oh. What's the one piece that they need to get put over the top, Dad? 
I expect that from Red Eye. <laughs> um, I, this is what I alluded to earlier. Experience. And they got that. That's why I think they're not a flash in the pan. They got that experience. Junior Three playoff Blue? games. I, I need the the coaching to have faith in what they're doing. What I saw on Sunday was the first half, a lot of first down passes. Second half, none of that. The running back, Grant, who was obviously faster. Where did he go? Obviously mm. faster Corey than anybody Grant. on the field. Yes. All of a sudden, second half. Was missing. Was missing. Um, defense. They're playing man all first half. Gronk goes down. Now let's switch it up and play zone. Yeah. All of a sudden, you let Tom Brady have faith in what you're doing. Yeah. Play to win. You, no you reason to play zone plan. against the yeah. Patriots. It's, you had a game plan. Follow it. It's my big, biggest pet peeve in sports. You see it across all sports where teams start to play not to lose instead of playing to win. Like, mm-hmm. go get it. For me, the one piece that Jacksonville needs, uh, I, they got to get a playmaker outside. Like, a legit, surefire, someone to dictate the matchup. Right. Like the best teams offensively, they have a one two punch where, you know, and they've got that guy in Leonard Fournette on the inside. They need an outside player. I, I think that if they had that piece on mm-hmm. Sunday, they for sure beat the Patriots. Is, is it me real quick or does he not see the outside holes? It seems like he'd rather just run up into the guard and get two yards. Well, he's got a little bit of a McGrady uh, situation okay. with his. All right, I wasn't going to say that. But... <laughs> <laughs> You follow you're, me? You're on fire. <laughs> I'm on fire. <laughs> All right. Oh so Kevin. that concludes. Huh, Kevin? Oh, yeah. What's the one piece for Jacksonville, Kev? I'm still trying to get over the fact that you just said Terrence Newman was giving somebody the, the Robbie Anderson treatment. <laughs> Mike Zimmer. <laughs> Mike Zimmer, to be clear. Uh, but no, it's, it's, it's funny you said that because I agree spot on. My response was. You think so, too? You think Terrence Newman is? No. I, with the Jaguars, <laughs> thing, y'all, they, they need more versatility on offense. And of course, we can blame Blake Borders, but they need something more from their receivers than just crossing routes to kind of open up their offense that's already struggling. Just, I definitely agree just someone that commit, yeah, just someone that's going to commit attention. Comes back? Um, I think I think there are a lot of teams. Devin and I, we had this conversation. I feel like this is like the fifth time, like mm-hmm. five shows in a row, we've said we've had this conversation. <laughs> we should probably just start filming our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. There aren't very many number one receivers in football. No, not at all. And and I don't know I don't even know if Allen Robinson's a number one receiver, but I know he's gonna get some offers. And so and that's why I think a guy like especially a guy like Tom Coughlin, is he gonna open the coffers yeah. uh to pay a guy like Allen Robinson? Coming off of ACL. Coming off of ACL, I'm not sure. Like but I, they've got to know that that's something they have to address. So I, I definitely don't think that that's gonna happen. Yeah. Um and this brings up a, a, a segment that we've been <laughs> brewing and stewing Devin on. Kevin couldn't wait. I think Dude. Kevin wanted to say something about Jacksonville. <laughs> no, he's good. Let him run. He's, Let him he, run. Said, he said enough. His baby <laughs> Jack. But this is something that especially uh, Red O has been, you know, chomping at the bit just to, just to get out. And, and what this is, we have finally reached Chaining Day. And for those of you who don't know what Chaining Day is, that means somebody got to make a commitment. And if you <laughs> if you've ever watched or if you watched the first episode of Thirty Two Kings Road, we mentioned that Kenny King Ken has a commitment issue, and he does not have an NFL team. Um, so what it comes down to is he got to come home today, <laughs> <laughs> literally. Uh. So so we have we have two Los Angeles teams now. We have the Los Angeles Rams, uh, which is represented by. Uh, the Cas- uh, we got the that? Rams, the Casadores. Casadores, and we also have the Los Angeles Chargers, which are represented by the uh, Presidente. El Presidente. Um, and this you can use your imagination to figure out why, why, which is which. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so th- this year, what was a very interesting year for the for uh, two teams. One just moved over to Los Angeles. The other is their second year. Um, they both had new head coaches. Um, Anthony Lynn uh, for the Chargers and uh, Sean McVay for um, the Rams. Uh, they, the, the, he's already going in. He's uh, like, did you make a decision already? You just started drinking. <laughs> no, nah, I just wanted to see Final if it, taste. Maybe yeah. if it <laughs> changes. Right, if, if it changes. If so, it changes. So it, it, uh, both teams, uh, you know, exceeded their expectations from the previous year. Um, in 2016, the Chargers uh, were 5-11. and 11. Uh, this year, uh, they were nine and seven. Even though they lost their first four games, right, right. Uh, three of, of which by a grand total of seven points. 
because uh, they had the wrong kicker. Young and who, Ho. Young Ho. And who was the kicker that they uh, cut? Lambo. Yeah. Lambo. And he was doing it. Lambo thing. was putting the yeah. boot on yeah, Sunday. He missed one uh, field goal, I believe, all season. Yeah. Um, and then we have uh, the the Rams, uh, you know, got rid of Jeff Fisher. They were 4-12. <laughs> and and then now this year they came back 11-5, and five and they won their division. So what we wanted to do is uh, we wanted to have sort of a, I guess, a competition um, to kind of decide this for uh, Brother Kenny Ken Ken. And we're going to go down the list. We're going to ask uh, Brother Kenyon a couple questions. And then whichever has the most check boxes is going to win this. Uh, do you need your pen? Uh, yeah, I got my pen here. No, do you need it? Because... Oh, you want it? Yes, I'd like to. So, uh, which team has the better roster? So, with the rosters, uh, I looked at, and this is, this is guys, because Devin asked me this beforehand, <laughs> and I said, this is real. This is going to be the team that I rock with. This is, you know, we're all in at this point. You're committing, can you? I am committing. I know uh, it's hard for you. It's very hard. <laughs> um, the rosters, I just looked at uh, the under 25 talent for both teams. So looking at the Rams, the most talented players, 25 and under, you've got Todd Gurley. You've got Farrell Cooper-ish. <laughs> uh, you've got Robert Woods, fight on, graduate of Gardena Sarah High School. You've got Cooper Cup. You've got Gerald Everett, tight end, also tight end, Tyler Higby, and obviously you have Jared Goff and Aaron Donald. But they've got to, they've got to fix that situation, but we'll put them on there. <laughs> San Diego, I mean, sorry, Los Angeles, <laughs> 25 and <laughs> Already disrespecting them. <laughs> we see where this is going. For We've us. got Keenan <laughs> Allen. We've got Joey Bosa. We've got Mike Williams. We've got Melvin Ingram. We've got Forrest Lamp. We've got Hunter Henry. We've got Denzel Perryman. And to a lesser extent, we've got Hayes Pollard. I'm, I'm leaning towards the Chargers, Junior Blue. Mm. I mean, I mean that's, they, they have more talent. They got more talent. The roster and... More and young talent, let's say. Young. Well, yeah. And, 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 into, and coming into the... Yeah. Donald. And coming... Exactly. <laughs> well, and, exactly. Yeah. And coming into the season, that was the thing that, you know, why I thought the Chargers would be better than the Rams is because the 53-man roster-wise, you know, I like the Chargers. I like the Chargers. So, staying in that vein, um, who has the better contracts yeah, like when you look at uh, salary <laughs> cap, free agency contracts. Okay, so let's start with the Rams. These are all of their free agents, key free agents. Connor Baldwin, outside linebacker, loves Wade Phillips. I believe he had five sacks this season. Pivotal player. 36 or 34. Yeah, Sammy Watkins <laughs> led the team in touchdowns, eight touchdowns. <laughs> and here's the thing about Sammy, which we didn't talk about when you review them. Remember, they traded two players and a second-round pick for Sammy Watkins. So, although we're like, really, you're going to sign Sammy Watkins? No. <laughs> if you don't sign him, <laughs> you lost him. You lost him. <laughs> uh, and you lost those players and that pick. Nikhil Roby Coleman, their slot corner. John mm -hmm. Sullivan, who, if Sean McVay is reason number one why Jared Goff was good, John Sullivan is reason number two. Uh, he's the center for the Rams. Trumaine Johnson in the secondary. They franchised him two years in a row. Gotta Can't, pay him. Gotta pay him. Uh, LaMarcus Joyner. Gotta pay him. Gotta pay him. <laughs> Cody Davis, yet another secondary. Uh, Dominique Easley, who was hurt this season. Defensive tackle. He's got some talent. He is hurt a lot, though. But they like him. And then the swing tackle, Darnell Williams. And then that guy named Donald that we mentioned earlier, who's not a free agent, but he clearly wants to be paid. He wants to. Uh, he needs to. He be should paid. be paid. <laughs> so I've given you a. I've given myself one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten quality names. Eleven actually, if you count Donald. Nine of which need to be addressed. They only have thirty-nine million dollars available. How much do the Chargers have? The Chargers have thirty-three million dollars available. But I'm just going to call out names, and you tell me who you know. Uh, <laughs> Jerry Atouche, and I don't even know if I'm saying that right. He didn't start. Touche. Uh, Trey Boston was a starting safety for them. Mm -hmm. Played pretty well. Jeff Cumberland, tight end number four. Kellen Clemens, okay. Antonio Gates, okay. Chris Hairston, a swing tackle. He did play some. Nick Novak, 
who was hurt and replaced three times over. Mm-hmm. Brandon Oliver, who's the random running back that they always have that just comes out of nowhere yeah. and has a great fantasy week. Uh, he has to replace the guy that gets hurt. That's his job. Yeah. Uh, Tinny, Tinny Palapui. Oh. Yep. Michael Schofield. Swing tackle. Prison break. Yep. Matt <laughs> Slauson, who is the team captain. He plays guard. Okay. Matt Slauson, key name. Chris McCann. A restricted free agent. He compliments Bosa and Ingram as a DN and Tyrell Williams. And they have $33 million to spend. I get the feeling that outside of Trey Boston, everybody walking. Everybody else is expendable. Mm-hmm. So, is, is, Kevin, can I, am, am I wrong about that? I have no dog in this fight, Kenyon. You are <laughs> on this. You're on this ship alone, sir. <laughs> so I, I get the feeling that that's another check for the Chargers. I think it's a check for the Chargers. What do you think, Dad? Uh, that money figure is is a big deal. They got a lot of names that because, they got. Because how much on the on the Ram side is Mr. Donald going to take up? <laughs> <laughs> and 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 Les Snead came out and kind of dropped his nuts and was like, "Yeah, Aaron Donald's important, but he's not the priority." Oh, mm. well, hey, alarming. Next ne- next category. <laughs> next category uh, is coaching. Ooh. All right. So here's the thing, right? If I put on my civil rights hat <laughs> and I look at the and I look at the Los Angeles Chargers coaches, I see Anthony Lynn, brother, George Stewart, brother, Ken Wisenhunt, who wishes he was a brother, <laughs> Gus Bradley, who was the former defensive coordinator uh, up in uh, Seattle with a lot of brothers, Ron Milas, defensive back, he's a brother, uh, Alfredo Roberts, running backs coach, brother. Uh, Dan Shamash, who's definitely a minority, so we give him that. Uh, Chris Harris, assistant defensive backs coach, brother. <laughs> Eric Henderson, assistant defensive line, brother. We- D- Antone Lynn, defensive assistant, clearly the son of the head coach, brother. Marquise Williams, assistant special teams, brother. Larry Jackson, assistant strength coach. But they got a lot of brothers we see, on there. We see that, Fight we see the that. power. Anthony Lynn is, <laughs> I'm just saying, Anthony Lynn is trying to, he's trying to change the Rooney rule all by himself, <laughs> right? And then you look at the Rams coaches. And what I see here is I see a guy in Matt LaFleur as the offensive coordinator who's definitely going to be a head coach at some point. He was getting a lot of buzz, so he's not going to be there for long. We've got Wade Phillips, who is... 80, 80, 85,000 years old. Bum so we don't know son. how long. Bum son. Yeah. It's not going to be there long. We've got John Fossil, whose destiny is only to be a special teams coordinator and an interim coach. <laughs> We've got Joe Barry, who's also, his name has come up as uh, as a head coaching candidate. So I believe he's going to be gone at some point. Um, and then we got a bunch of guys. Oh, Aaron Cromer, who he did something illegal in New Orleans, I think. I think he beat somebody's ass or he maybe had a drug <laughs> conviction. What I'm saying is, is that. I really do like the Chargers coaching staff over the Rams, but Sean McVay and the work he did with Jared Goff, I give the edge to the Rams. So you say all that to say this. (laughs) 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 Fucking loquacious bastard. I could have said that shit in two seconds. (laughs) Um, I'm going to lump these together. Front office and ownership. Who gets the nod there? Yeah, no one likes uh, Dean Spanos. No, not not a soul. Not a soul, right? So it's it's Crunky, and I like Crunky's last <laughs> name too. Cause I'm always about getting crunk. Um, what's the score right now? Uh, Two it's up. tied up. Tied Two up. up. All right. I um, need you to love me. We got. We have. Uh, <laughs> we went. We have four more categories. Let's try to get through them uh, in rapid fashion. Quarterback. Yep. Quarterback. God, this is mm, so hard. That man. is a good one, isn't it? Because I, I to be truthful, I would be a Chargers fan. If I just knew what Phillip Rivers was going to hey, do he in two has, years. I got nine kids to feed. <laughs> if he were, yes, actually, I take that back. Not if I knew what he's going to do in two years. If he were 30, I'd be a Chargers I'd be a Chargers fan. I have to say Jared Goff. He's too, he's, he, he has too many kids to not keep playing. But I say Jared Goff. All right. Uh, star players. Uh, the Rams have one and a half because... They really are trying to mess up this Aaron Donald situation, <laughs> I feel like. Uh, Todd Gurley, Aaron Donald. The Chargers, they don't have superstars, but Keenan Allen is solid. Work. Melvin Gordon is solid. Joey Bosa. Joey is Bosa is a superstar. Star. I correct. Yeah, I he is a superstar. <laughs> I was Joey, Bosa, yeah, Joey Bosa is a superstar. Melvin Ingram, solid. Mm-hmm. Chargers. 
Uh, now these are sort of like super whatever questions, but they matter. They matter. They matter. Because what's the score right now? <laughs> three up. <laughs> three up. <laughs> You guys know where this is going? Uniforms. Uh, Uniforms. Okay. okay, I got a clear. So put up the picture first of the, the powder blue chargers. They are sweet. They, they've they been sweet fire. forever. Fire. <laughs> fire. Fire. Now, the Rams alternate uniform is nice too. But. Color rush? Yeah, that color rush. I like that. But that powder blue is classic. Co- uh, yeah. Chargers. Fire. It's fire. Uh, and last but not least, which can decide it all. Shout out to our friends in the UK, uh, Ryan's dad. Yep. Um, who has he? I still can't remember what. It's a beautiful name. I feel like it's like some Italian poultry. Mm. Every time he sends us a tweet, I just yeah. look at the name, stare at the name. I know it's him, and he has such love and affection for us. He gave me a wonderful suggestion when we were overseas, and you know we discussed my plight about figuring out which team to root for. He said, "Look at the." cheerleaders look at the cheerleaders i thought it was great advice so i figured why not these are the los angeles charger cheerleaders and i just want to canvas with you guys as you're looking at them i am uh (laughs) first of all mike i'm you know what i thought about saying it when i was looking at the pictures today but i'm not gonna go there don't do it okay Kevin, I see a lot of curly. curly. You see, see a you, lot of curly you got, hair. So everybody, hold on, hold on, put put it back up. Everybody, take a mental note. Yep. All right, we all got the Los Angeles Chargers. Mm-hmm. You know, all right, I like, I like curly hair. Now let's let's <laughs> let's go to the Rams. Is that Sage still at the bottom? Hey, I thought that was Sage <laughs> in the corner, bottom right. I thought that was Sage. Now let's look at the Rams cheerleaders, twenty seventeen. Uh, we all know Devin got a type though. <laughs> Kevin, you're taking the middle note, right? Devin, uh, Les, uh, Junior Blue. Yeah, that's not even fair. All right. I'm going to put it down uh, for you. <laughs> <laughs> ten, ten. Hey. Come on, hey. Hey. Come on, baby. Hey. Come on, hey. Baby. Kevin, which which cheerleaders did you like? Uh, uh, we lost Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> you like that picture, though. That's a great picture. Um, Dad? It doesn't matter what I like. What do you like, I'm sir? just saying. Just I just. I already said I like curly hair. Well, it yeah, was a lot of that. It was a lot of that for the Chargers, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of mixed chicks in there, huh? Junior yeah. Blue. Yeah, it was. It was the Chargers. It was the Chargers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kevin, by was it far. by far? Chargers by far. Yeah, hey, I was I, trying you know, to find like one. Just like my drink that could kill <laughs> all the Chargers. Uh huh. But I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, huh? It, mm. You know what I got to say about these cheerleaders for both teams? Very diverse. And I'll just leave it it's there. It's Los Angeles, baby. It's Los Angeles. They well, did I never that. left. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I agree. I, I thought the Chargers. I thought the Chargers cheerleaders. So um, there you have it. They worked it. So the, the score is five to three. Five to three. The Chargers. Five to three. The Chargers. All right. Oh, so day. we're gonna do three seconds. The Presidente represents the uh, Los Angeles Chargers. Anthony Lynn. I'm all in, baby. It's the Los Angeles Woo! Chargers. Yeah. Less. Hey, guess what? We, we so play, now you we gotta get your charger gear. Huh? We play y'all bitches next year. <laughs> Where at? Oh, in L.A. Ooh. In L.A. Salute to the Chargers. Oh, that I'm gonna regret in a few minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I am a Chargers fan. That Ooh. concludes 32 Kings Road for this episode. That's not where I thought it was going. <laughs> I thought I you know, I told you it was just going to All the way with McVay. Uh, yeah, I thought so too, but uh, you know, chaining day. It is what it is. Uh shout out to IPA, shout out to Blue Moon, shout out to Stella, shout out to Brandy Presidente <laughs> and Casa Dores. Uh Kevin had agua. Kevin had water. Please conserve all over the world. Uh, before we get out of here, want to do a special mention next week, and I'm really proud of this. We are going to have, and this is all I'll say, please follow us on social media for more details, but we are going to have our first NFL dignitary guest in studio next week. I am super excited about that. It's onward and upward from here. Thank you for visiting 32 Kings Road. Follow us everywhere on social media. Our handle is at the league AM. Check us out next week. We'll have a special in-studio guest. That's Instagram. That's Twitter. That's Facebook. Visit our website, theleagueam.com. We will see you next week. Cheerio. Dilly, dilly. Dilly, dilly. No games as From the window. We got Kenny Ken Ken. Put a hundred on a cheese with the street for the cash. He yes, be in. Seth Curry with the shot. The prodigy. In reality, he's more like Seth. 
but he's all we got. Up next is Gentleman Jack, better known as Junior Blue. We told him not to do it anyway, but he did what he do. To his right is Devin, that dude, L Dad or Dirt Ass Dan. Just don't ask him a question, cause then he'll answer your question with another question, and then he'll add another question on top of that question. Damn. And now I'm Red O. The Buck Wild Problem Child. Slow Butter, aka John Cutter. It's the league ambassadors, and we playing to win. At the two yard line, and make no mistake, we running it in. 